Here goes nothing. That was loud. Like that? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So I wrote two speeches for today. I wrote a brave one and a safe one. And I said I'd go with my gut when I got up here. So will I do the brave one? Yay! Okay, here goes. More than a hundred years ago, the suffragette Alice Paul described the women's movement like this. Each of us puts in one little stone and then you get a great mosaic at the end. The suffragettes won the vote, but they also laid the groundwork for the mosaic of rights and freedoms women enjoy today. All of us have come here to lay down our own little stones. I can feel the weight of them in the air. I can feel the weight of this stone too, which my wife carved for me yesterday after she read this speech. And I can feel something else in the cold air in Dublin today. I can feel the presence of other survivors here. There are more than a few of us. Can you feel it? Yes. Yeah. I stand shoulder to shoulder with every one of you. None of us are alone today. And I know that everybody here stands with us in defense of vulnerable children. Hurt, lost children like little me who I rescued from those rooms where she fought monsters in the dark. She's right here with me today, protected and fierce. I can almost feel her hands in mine. I'm thinking of my own children too today as I do every day. I swore a solemn oath to them before they were born that little people will be safe around me. That I will be the last person my difficult childhood hurts. And that regardless of the cost, I will speak the truth, take names, and set boundaries when it comes to safeguarding children. As you may know, I've been vocal about doing just that on my Twitter account, Fem Loves. Last summer, I wrote a series of threads and articles about safeguarding. They were intended to help people, and they have done. My inbox is full of messages from survivors who tell me they feel seen, heard, understood, and less alone. But my most cherished messages are those from the mothers who've read my threads and were brave enough to take action to protect their children based on what they learned. Unfortunately, one of those threads was reported to the police by a man I didn't even mention by name. And for a month now, I've been living under first the threat of arrest and now the threat of prosecution. All the while, I've kept my silence about the complainant in this case. But increasingly, as time goes on, I've been asking myself one question. Who is emboldened by my silence? I know the answer, and so do you. In the light of the promises I made to my children, the answer to that question shames me. I know more than I want to about paedophiles, predators, and perverts, and I know this. They get really cozy, really fast with particular types of people. People who advertise their vulnerability to grooming, even through their silence. I'm here today to tell you that I am not one of those people. I'm here to keep my promise to my children. And I'm here to tell you that if calling out rhetoric that endangers children is a crime, then I'm taking my crime spree across the border and making it international. Yeah! I've not been charged with anything. So there's no court order restricting me to silence about the name of the man who reported me. However, some might say it's best to avoid pulling tigers by the tail. But David Paisley is not a tiger. (laughs) David Paisley is a hurt little boy. David Paisley is the boy who cried wolf. A hurt little boy who in his hurt lashes out and hurts others. It's hard even to be angry with him when he probably isn't capable of grasping how or why his words are so dangerous. For the avoidance of all doubt, I am not accusing David Paisley of being an abuser, but he knows nothing about how to keep children safe. And like an entitled little child, he wades in anyway, thrashes about and muddies the waters of this debate. I hate to see little boys hurting, I really do. But I have to treat Paisley like a man. A man whose rhetoric blurs the boundaries on child protection. A man who attempted to dox me. 
and in his genius concluded that I resided in London. She <laughs> told me all of it. <laughs> A man who repeatedly, over the course of the, a week, reported me to the police for my tweets. I do not owe him kindness. I do not owe him protection. I do not owe him my silence. And silent about that man's wrong-headed interventions in this debate, I will no longer be. In the wake of the Wee Spa incident, where an adult male exposed his genitals to women and girls, Paisley tweeted, and I quote him directly, Bodies are just bodies. When did we get so weird about the idea of seeing another human? And he wrote this. This whole moral panic stranger danger thing about other people's genitalia is mad. It's practically a condition. Let's call it stanolanditis. Perhaps most egregiously in the context of the same debate, he tweeted out that he shared a bath with his mother in childhood, that she watched him pee, and that he provided her with personal care when she was ill. I'm raising funds. I believe he's telling the truth, but it would never cross my mind to mention that kind of private detail about my relationship with my boys in public, let alone to use it to justify adult males exposing their genitals to women and girls they do not know. Yeah. But Paisley doesn't matter. Not really. Who is he even? He's nobody to me. He's a sideshow, that's all. The people who matter are the survivors. We're called survivors, by the way, because not all of us make it out. I'm thinking about those survivors here today and those in my inbox. I'm thinking about little me too. She's safe in my heart, boundaried about and well beloved. And I'm thinking about my children who I would protect with my last breath. And I'm doing my best to honor the promise I made to them before I ever held them in my arms. I regard promises as sacred. I've only made five promises in my whole life and I've kept all of them. But I promise you something today. I promise you that if you will have me, I will stand with you. That I will bring my little stone, this little stone here that I will carry close to my heart. And then no matter what water has passed under what bridges, I will lay my little stone down beside yours. Beside yours, beside yours, beside yours beside Alice Pauls and beside the suffragettes, on the streets of Dublin, beside Rachel Morans and Roddy Colleen's and Women's Space Ireland and the LGB Alliance Ireland and Graham Linehan and Leisha de Bruins, beside Isle Waits and Stella O'Malley, on the streets of Belfast, beside those of my sisters working behind the scenes in Northern Ireland, and over the water too, beside Myers and Alisons and Marians and Helens and Kathleen's and Sonia's and Bev's. I will lay my little stone down beside the stones laid by all the anonymous Twitter accounts across these islands. And perhaps most importantly of all, beside the little stones of many colours laid, one conversation at a time, one risk at a time, by ordinary men and women and families, in homes and in communities. But we won't make a mosaic of our stones. We'll raise up a wall, a shield wall around vulnerable children, a world to protect the innocent and keep out those who would harm them. We have a common cause and a common enemy. And if we can stand together, shoulder to shoulder, we will win. Oh, that's too, too near now. Okay. Not to lose, not to lose all that goodwill. Right. So we're going to stor storm the place, yeah? <laughs> we have to go individually. Uh, I apologise, a lot of people don't need to hear this, but there's a few who might. Um, this is a kind of an odd uh, fight we're in. Oh, do what? Here? This is kind of an odd fight we're in because most of the most of the people involved are women, and uh, I sometimes feel like there's a, a reluctance to express anger from women. 
So today I want to talk about how you need to overcome that reluctance and enjoy and take courage from your anger. Sometimes it feels like we've already lost this one. So much has already been taken away. The privacy, safety and dignity that come with single sex spaces are gone, even to the most vulnerable women. Women in prison or in rape crisis centres or shelters can no longer be certain they are safe. The thrill of competing, the level playing field of women's sports, gone with cheating men in women's categories, stealing their medals, their records, their careers, and worst of all, the threat to children, dangerous experimental treatments that leave them infertile, depressed, and in need of constant painful correction, all happening in plain sight, with our politicians terrified of challenging the faithful. That sounds familiar to me, as I'm sure it does to you. Ireland is once again offering up its women and children to a religion. A religion cooked up not in the Vatican, the source of so much historic injustice, but in the halls of American universities and the endless show trials that pass for online discourse. The Magdalene laundries are gone, but the priests who ran them and the nuns who collaborated are still with us, using the familiar weapons of faith and shame. So today I want to encourage you to do a single simple thing. Take the anger you feel that all, all that has already been done, done in secret so far, and use it, channel it, let it give you the hope and energy you need to fight this. Get angry. Get angry at the politician who allowed self-ID to pass in the dark. Get angry at the school teacher grooming your child into this ideology. Get angry at the press for looking the other way. Angry women are terrifying. <laughs> Ask any married man, which I used to be. But that, and that's why there's not more men here. They're scared of you because you're angry. That's why television don't dare put a gender critical feminist on screen because their anger would make every television in the country explode. <laughs> you want to see fireworks? Have Colm O'Gorman tell Helen Joyce that trans women are women. <laughs> that Eddie Izzard is the same sex as her. Have them say it to their faces. They wouldn't dare. They know they wouldn't leave the studio in one piece. <laughs> now some of you may be frightened of your anger. I understand mine has got me into a lot of trouble. And the new priests can be pretty frightening. And their demands that you feel shame for standing up your, for your humanity can be convincing, echoed as they are by the faithful all over social media. So if you ever find it faltering or fading in the face of opposition, you just have to ask yourself a few questions. How many more women should be raped in prison? Not one more. How many young girls should cut off their healthy breasts or take drugs that destroy their sexual pleasure? Not, Not one, one more. more. How many women should be driven offline and have their livelihoods threatened by young misogynistic men with purple highlights in their hair? Not, Not no, one more. more! How many more bomb threats delivered to J.K. J. K. Rowling will we stand for? Not, Not one, one more. more! How many more women should lose a place on a podium or in an awards shortlist taken by a cross-dressing autogynophile? Not, Not one, one more. more! Don't give an inch. Don't give them an inch. Don't give up a single right that was fought for a hundred years ago. It's not enough to resist every new outrage. We have to undo the outrages that have already been committed against you. If you see a unisex changing room, complain. If someone calls you cis, tell them I find that word offensive. And if you see a man that's in a space that's meant for women, speak up, summon up the furies, Get that look in your eye that turns every man's blood to ice. <laughs> because finally, it's your anger that will win this fight. I get angry all the time and it does nothing because everyone just thinks I'm mad. <laughs> but if every woman here gets angry and encourages every woman they know to get angry too, then this absurd, incoherent, irrational, misogynistic, homophobic fad will wither and die. And not a moment too soon. Thank you. Yeah. Where's Alicia? Just need to get you in. Everyone hear me?
After press the trigger. My speech. Oh, my speech today is not about trans rights. I'm not here to talk about genuine trans-identified people, many of whom contact me regularly because they're appalled at what's been done in their name. Instead, I'm here to talk about the erosion of women's rights and child safeguarding that's happening as a direct result of modern day trans activism. We are among a handful of countries in the world who have brought in full self ID. Elsewhere, this system is overseen by a panel of doctors and lawyers. But in Ireland, there is no gatekeeping whatsoever. We switched from the medical model to full self ID at the last minute intoxicated with a vision of ourselves as a newly progressive casting off our dark past if this amendment goes through without a clear and explicit ring fencing of our spaces places and services based on biological sex not gender then we are facing next level self-id which would mean that at any time any man could identify into any female only space without a gender recognition certificate. This is not scaremongering. This is already happening in Canada and the US. Like in Loudoun County, Virginia, where a boy who identified as a girl was allowed to use the girls' toilets at his school and raised a girl there. Or in Wee Spa in downtown Los Angeles, where the serial sex offender Darren Moreger exposed himself to women and children in the women's section of the spa. Are we really to believe that predators won't use the exact same laws and the exact same lack of safeguarding to access their victims? Have we learned nothing in this country? Self-ID is deeply unpopular with people once they understand what it actually does. Our Countess Red Sea poll shows that Irish people are supportive of self-ID but only in a social setting. They want our spaces and services separated on the basis of biological sex, not gender identity. Our poll showed that fewer than one in five people in Ireland support self-ID. And that is why activists have to push through these bills to enforce gender ideology on the people. This amendment to our Equality Acts, the Hate Crime Bill, the Anti-Conversion Therapies Bill, the expansion of self-ID to children, the indoctrination of our children in our schools, the policing of our language, all serve to criminalize dissent and enforce the new religion. We're here to tell women that we understand the profound psychic pain and cognitive dissonance caused when criminal men who self-ID as women are reported as women by the media. These are not our crimes. When mothers are called birthing parents, not mothers, having grown a human being inside them and a new organ the placenta to nourish it. When only little girls are held down and cut with a scalpel, yet they are people with vulvas. When there are 200 million fewer girls in the world because they are aborted or killed before they take their first breath. When Irish women are still being dragged through the courts and mothers are dying because the state covered up its own incompetence in the cervical check scandal. When women who gave birth on tables, goaded by nuns, are told they were not abused. When 80 year olds have to fight the state in the courts and a healthcare system that oversaw a policy of cutting their pelvises in half. None of these things happen to people. They happen to women and girls who cannot identify out of their oppression. We do not accept this dehumanizing language from the media and from our legislators who have excised the word mother and the word woman from seven bills retroactively. We stand with the incarcerated women of Ireland, 80% of whom are mothers. 
35% of whom are non-violent petty offenders, imprisoned for, imprisoned for crimes related to poverty, to addiction, to coercive relationships. They should not even be in prison. But as I speak to you here today, they are, and they're housed with fully intact male prisoners. One of whom raped his stepson, his four-year-old stepson, for two years, threatening to break the little boy's arms and legs if he told anyone. That man was given a gender recognition certificate, and it gets worse. Initially, he was housed in the Doka Centre, the unit for mothers and their infants. We stand with the incarcerated women of California who are handed condoms and given extra time if they misgender their assailants. If your head is exploding right now, don't worry, you're normal. Your reaction is normal. You just didn't realize that we're in the upside down. A place where we no longer keep rapists apart from women to keep women safe, but we imprison them with women. We are living through a new era of doublespeak, of groupthink, of witch hunt, of denial of biological reality, and of ideological totalitarianism that the West has never seen. And worst of all, it is the most vulnerable women and the most vulnerable children who are fodder for this gender machine. For 75 years of the 100 years of this state, we incarcerated unmarried mothers and their children. Those children were allowed to die in dying rooms. They were buried in unmarked graves. Those graves are yet unexhumed. The ones who lived were sold everybody knew. These laws are a new turn of that same wheel. We have segued seamlessly from one bureaucracy to the next. A secret Jesuit committee wrote our 1937 constitution and now unelected, unrepresentative activists are grooming our politicians and pushing through these laws. We Irish are historically very good at doing the dumb thing. We keep the head down, we say nothing. The famine, colonialism and the church all intertwined to hardwire this into our collective consciousness. But unlike those men and women who came before us and looked the other way, we will not be cowed. We do not submit to the new religion, yeah, and we yeah. will be heard. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Press the button. Trigger. Trigger. Oh, you have to hold it in. Yeah. Now we've got it. This is an open letter to Minister Robert O'Gorman from the Irish Women's Lab. Is that, if you hold the thing in front, if you hold the thing in front of it. Ah, I see, I see. Okay, this is going to be a juggling act. <laughs> Minister O'Gorman, it was with great dismay that we watched your response to Senator Sharon Joan in the Shannon last week when she raised the issue of violent and sex offending adult males in Irish women's jails. You flatly ignored the concerns she raised, which centred around the rights of incarcerated women. There was no surprise, Minister O'Gorman served us up a loud, strong echo of the past. Irish women are very used to the experience of not being valued enough to be listened to. It's been an intergenerational experience. The rights of women have fallen on deaf ears for many centuries on this island, but we're here to tell you women's rights have been ignored long enough in this country. From the cruelty and brutality of the Magdalene laundries and the mother and baby homes, Irish women treated like battery hands by the combined power of a church and state that conspired to withhold contraception from our mothers and grandmothers when it was available for decades elsewhere in the West. From the horror of some physiotomy when the pelvises of pregnant women, wide awake and with no anaesthetic, were hacked apart with saws 
maiming women for life. All of this, absolutely all of it, centred around the denial of women's bodily autonomy. Note that there was no male counterpart for the homes for fallen women. Ireland never created nor even conceived of homes for fallen men. It was as if our foremothers were impregnating each other or themselves and were treated accordingly. Make no mistake, a woman's body has been a public space for every day of the history of this state and this day is no different. The optimistic among us might like to think that we've moved on. But the Eighth Amendment was repealed in 2018, three years after. Can I ask someone to hold this for me because my hand is just... It's losing out now at this stage. Thank you. Thanks, girls. Just a moment. Let me see. Where am I? The Eighth Amendment. Well, the Eighth Amendment was repealed in 2018, three years after the self-ID aspect of the 2015 Gender Recognition Act allowed any man in Ireland to simply declare himself a woman with no safeguarding, no psychological evaluation, no gatekeeping of any kind. By sleight of hand, the state has given us dominion over our own female bodies after having withdrawn control over the spaces our bodies occupy. We are now in the absurd position where state-funded organisations with a specific remit to fight for women's rights have actually campaigned to remove our rights to media and political representation. Most notable among these groups is the National Women's Council. And finally, to be as clear as I can be, legislation that allows male sex offenders to identify into women's prisons is a class issue. As if the blatant sexism were not enough, and for you, Minister O'Gorman, it clearly is not enough. We must recognise that incarcerated women are drawn from the very most marginalised, disadvantaged and vulnerable groups in this country. Intergenerational poverty and educational disadvantage are the hallmarks of incarcerated women as a group. It is no coincidence that the forced women to experience the loss of their sex-protected spaces are the women positioned lowest on the ladder of society. The entwinement, the entwinement of sexism and classism is embedded in the history of this nation and in particular of this city from the days when one full horde of Dublin's population desperately struggled for survival in the fallen down mansions of the rich where in a spectacular crescendo of cruelty the employer class achieved its aim by starving the children of the poor in the 1913 lockout we remembered less than a decade ago. The entwinement of sexism and classism is very much our history and to a large extent our legacy, but it does not have to be our future. The Irish state has always been willing to sacrifice women and girls for the national identity, first as the most Catholic country in the world, now as the most progressive country. However, at this time it is not hidden behind the high walls of the religious institutions. It is in plain sight and the people of Ireland will not stand for it, not again. The state may not have learned from the cruel abuses of the past, but the Irish people surely have. So to you, Minister O'Gorman, we are here, working and middle class women alike, Irish women and migrant women, women from the North and from the Republic, older women and younger women, and men, to say women's rights are not up for debate. <laughs> What we'd love to get is a group photo of everybody to show the great, fantastic turnout. Thank you, everybody. It's been brilliant. Where do you want us all over there? Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for being here again. This is dead. Dan, you all gather for a group photo, please. And if we can get everybody's side.